Okay, I've got 30, maybe 40 minutes with you, so I'm going to try and talk through uh, revision for the merchant and um, the Duchess of Malfi. I'm going to be really quick, so maybe you might wish to take notes as we go through. Um, can I only really touch on things? I've designed this tutorial really for people who are struggling with the text, okay, because it's going to be content driven. It's going to be things that I think are important rather than going through questions. You might need to just jot down things in terms of what you need to revise that you're not quite sure of. So it'd be like a checklist if you like. Um, first of all, if I start on the merchant's path, um, it's not the merchant's path. Merchant's prologue and tail. You can't get a good answer unless you deal with both the prologue and tail. Okay. And you're dealing with context if you're talking about the prologue's relationship with the tail and the tail's relationship to the prologue. You can't talk about one without the other. Um, Lucy, you might need to just take some of the because other people are coming in and block the way. And it's gonna, uh, I don't have time for, um, so if you could move in just in case there's other people that come in. Just sit in that gap there, yeah? So let's consider, first of all, the relationship between the prologue and the tail. It's really important. And okay, so just move, just move back because it's going to block. Okay. Right. Try not to drag the chairs. Right. The merchant gives an ironic account of, this, of a courtly romance. I'm going to talk it about irony. My English teacher told me you can't talk, go into an exam about short and not mention irony at some stage. So just be, be aware of irony. So the tale is coloured by the merchant's cynicism about marriage. And uh, May's actions in the tale confirm the merchant's cynicism. So the tale is shaped by uh, the teller. And the teller shapes the tale. You don't get a tale from somewhere else, yeah? Okay. Parallels and contrast with the tale and the prologue then are really important. One other thing you should consider perhaps is that the tale mirrors other tales. And you should know about the marriage group of tales. And the Miller tales of Fablo. Um, and the Canterbury tale starts off with a true courtly love romance. And this is a parody of the courtly love romance. So knowing something about how the tale relates to the other marriage tales would be important. The Miller tells a tale about adultery and marriage as well. The Knight tells, tells a tale about courtly love romance, which is a pure courtly love romance. And the Clark tells a tale about a true, honourable, faithful wife. And so this tale is a response to other tales. You should be aware of that. Okay, so what's important about the prologue? Okay, you should commit to memory imagery about um, marriage being like a snare, a trap. Um, we've talked about how it's a response to the Clark's tale about this honourable wife, Lucille. The merchant's having none of it. He says, my wife isn't like that. So I'm going to tell a tale in response to the Clark's tale. And weapon and way into another story. Uh, this is the story of the merchant's marriage. And so everything is coloured. Everything is coloured by his experience of marriage. OK, the tale tales takes place in Italy, as does both tales. Okay, as the you should consider how Lombardy is a place of uh, supposed place of sin, and and the setting tells us something shorthand about January. You know, it's a it's a it's a it tells us something about his lecher lechery, perhaps a bit like sort of like an old middle middle aged man going off to Thailand now to sort of go on holiday. Um, Merchant talks ironically about marriage. So whenever the merchant praises marriage, he's being ironic. So irony runs through the story. So when the merchant uh, talks about 
truly marriage is God's gift or it's bliss, it's virtuous, and like better to live in a in the marriage state than the bottom ground of single singlehood, there's a deep irony because we know the merchant doesn't believe it. When we have references to old wives in the Bible, it's it's uh, ironic because these wives we know have the ability to deceive their husbands. So Rebecca, um, who are the other wives? I can't remember now. You should know them. Rebecca, Judith, Esther. So these are all examples that the audience would be aware are uh, uh, wives who can deceive. So foreshadowing is part of the entertainment of the story. Irony is part of the entertainment of the story. So what do we know about January? January has irony itself. He, he isn't aware of how he truly is. Okay, so um, he's the typical self-deceptive character in Fablo. He thinks he's a lover, but he's, he's more of a comic character. Uh, and so everything he says about preferring uh, young veal to old fish, uh, um, veal over beef, just shows how he's foolish to think he can control a young wife. He believes that he's like an evergreen tree, fully green always, and particularly downstairs. And he's not, of course he's not, he's an old man. Uh, so if you, get a, if you get a question about marriage or the role of women, don't forget there's other characters um, who are deeply unhappy in marriage. So, for instance, Justinus, I have wept many a tear since I have had a wife. A host at the end of the story says, oh, uh, I'm un deeply unhappy, ha unhappily married as well. Pluto in the tale, deeply unhappily married because he takes a young wife also. And the merchant, of course. The idea of the marketplace is deeply ironic. It's a place where an aristocrat, like a knight, who's almost like in the feudal estate, is like a god in his own kingdom, he's a king in his own kingdom. He can pick and choose a wife at will, like buying a coat. So we shouldn't uh, forget the monetary uh, value of the marketplace. Now, give uh, me for while I go quickly, but you'll, you'll be sent this PowerPoint afterwards as well. Look out for quotes about heaven, marriage being heaven. Remember that the quote says, you know, mine heaven here on earth. Now remember, you can't have two heavens. And so she may well be your purgatory. Get lots of references to the idea of hell being hell on earth in marriage. Okay. Uh, you probably want to revisit the wedding feast. Dorsa gives the wedding feast the most poetic part of the whole, um, the whole tale. Deeply poetic, lots of illusions, classical illusions. There was never the god of marriage, has never seen such a beautiful marriage before. The wedding feast is full of hyperbole. Why? Because it's it's really being ironic. The merchants being ironic in celebrating this most uncelebratory marriage. What's also funny in that in uh, the, the description of the wedding is perhaps. But we know deeply he can't wait to get it over with so he can get to bed with his new wife. Okay. So we often get the use of uh, a pause in the action. The merchant pause, or, or you could say Chaucer, pauses the action, gives us apostrophes, interjections. He's like an intrusive narrator. Uh, oh, January, see how Damien does be doing. So the narrator, be it the merchant or Chaucer, speaks almost directly to the characters through apostrophe. Uh, and it slows down the pace. So we want to get to the comical wedding night, and it's deliberately slowed down by our narrator. So what should we get from that? How the whole story is peppered with irony in many ways. Okay, I've got 25 slides, and I might have to jump through some of these. So think about some of the comedy in terms of contrast. We've got this old man with his loose skin, uh, like a ham fish rubbing against his, his young wife. She doesn't think anything of his action, of his, uh, she thinks not of being for his playing. Uh, look for the use of opposites in both stories. Fresh May, old, old January. Okay? Think about um, 
how the Duchess is seen as both angel or whore. You, know, you get lots of opposites in both of these stories. The billet doux is a love letter that Damien writes to her. Um, I don't know what I was trying to say by that. Is that jealousy, perhaps? Some people say that the, the Canterbury Tales are an exploration of all seven deadly sins. And perhaps the Merchant's Tale is the, the sin of lust, perhaps is being explored particularly, rather more than the sin of adultery. That's, that's not being criticised as much as the sin of lust, perhaps in January. In some ways, perhaps Chaucer is uh, somewhat sympathetic to May. She's not criticised in the same way as January is, you could argue. So let's consider where we are in irony, okay? There's irony in both texts. You can't watch a tragedy without knowing that it's a tragedy. It's dramatic irony in tragedy, because you know everyone's going to die, because it's the tragical history of the Duchess of Malfi. There's tragedy and dramatic irony in that text. We know what's going to happen to January, or the audience know, because it's a fablo. We know what's going to happen in the fablo. We know the merchant's unhappily married, and so he's going to tell a story about unhappily married people. He's not going to tell a happy ever after story, because we know he sees marriage as a snare. We have the ironic persona. What does that mean, really? But Chaucer is in the persona of a merchant. He takes on an ironic persona. So um, he's being ironic. He's not really a merchant, but he's adopting the persona of the merchant. And therefore, he's adopting a misogynistic persona. It's not necessarily Chaucer's persona. He's adopting an ironic persona. And I think sometimes that gets mixed up. A little bit like, you know, I don't know if you remember Ali G. You know, he used to be criticised for being racist, but he was adopting a persona of someone trying to be someone else. Okay? And I think that's what Chaucer's doing. He's adopting a persona of a deeply cynical, misogynistic man who tells a deeply misogynistic story. But it's also a humorous, fablo story that everyone ironically would know how it would end. So there's an irony of self, there's an irony of situation as well, which I'll talk a little bit about. Okay, the fact it's, it's set in Italy suggests it's, uh, particularly in Padua, a city of, I don't know if that's really true, but to British eyes, it's got, it had a reputation at, at the time of a place of prostitution, perhaps, and that's why he's situated there. So there's ironic references just in the locations. We have the ironic references to fruit in both texts, and that, of course, is the allusion to the Garden of Eden uh, story. And so we should be aware of the use of fruit in both texts. Apricots revealed to the solar perhaps that the Duchess is pregnant. I don't know why apricots in themselves suggest pregnancy, but you know, you know, that's what's that's what's being given. And bear up a pear tree. And he took down his smock and he was wrong. In the pear tree becomes the fruit tree becomes a place of sin. So the allusions to the Garden of Eden is deeply ironic. It takes place in a walled garden. The walled garden, the, the irony of that place is seen as like a place of fertility, uh, a symbol of the Virgin Mary, fertility intact. But Damien gets a key to the wicket. Again, the, the wicket and the clicket is deeply ironic, which has sexual connotation, of course. So I'm summarizing in some ways how you can't avoid talking about irony in Chaucer. And the irony, uh, the irony of self that, you know, he boasts, January boasts about being an evergreen tree, a laurel tree, if you like, that never loses its leaves or greenery. He's eternally young. Okay? And, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the obvious blindness of the old man who thinks he can have a young wife and control her, which is foolish and comic. Okay? And we see that as an ironic uh, sense of self. How he views himself is not how he comes across. Okay, to carry on the ironic descriptions, you've got the story of Pluto and Proserpina. Many people never mention Pluto and Proserpina, okay? But the idea of, you know, who are their equivalents on the other the Italian in the uh, Greek gods? Hades and Persephone, isn't it? Yes. So the old winter grabbing the young spring, again, it's the symbol. It's the old man with the young wife. 
And again, it's the power imbalance that we should be considering. So again, what we're seeing in these marriages is that the moral being don't marry a young wife. Okay? Because it's not going to work out. You know the, the rules by that. That the uh, half your age plus seven okay? universal rule. And he disobeys that. So let's consider the tale told, the spoken element. Um, May is quite interesting, and it's worth looking at where May doesn't say very much of the whole tale, and where she really truly speaks is when she truly lies. She says, I have a soul to keep. How dare you say that I would do anything? She says, for mine own honour. So she lies very convincingly. But the only time we ever really hear her speak is where she's really truly lying, uh, and that tells us something about the mercy. But it might be worth comparing where she speaks with when the Duchess speaks truth and lies as well. Pluto, of course, bangs on about misogynistic texts as well, and uh, and cites the unreliability of women to Proserpina, um, and she argues back at him. So really, we see a battle of the sexes in this, this tale of Pluto and Proserpina. But you could argue as all pairs with the battle of the sexes between uh, the Duchess and her brother Ferdinand and uh, uh, and Cardinal. She's not willing to do what they want them to, want her to do, and she's also willing to lie about it as well. Um, and they're unreasonable in their demands and what how they talk about women. Ferdinand talks about women the same way that Pluto and the merchant talks about women. So you should compare what they say about women. You've probably been given quite a few resources on that. Now, at the very end of the story, the host, Harry Bailey, the person who set up the storytelling competition, this fictional character, says, now such a wife, I pray God keeps from me. So it ends on a misogynistic note. The host's wife, who calls his own wife a labbing shrew, a, a labbing shrew. Again, the idea of women being compared to animals in both texts, you should commit to memory some of those quotes. Our women are always compared to animals. What is a shrew? Taming of the shrew. Shakespeare does the same thing. Is it a little rodent? I think it is. An angry little rodent. So think about the description of women in both texts. That would be worth comparing. Me Ruif saw I ever unto her tide, says the host. Again, another regretful marriage. Does Antonio regret marrying Duchess at any stage? It leads to his death, but he never seems to regret it, though, does he? Does the Duchess regret marrying? It leads to the death, her death, and the death of her husband, and the death of her nurse. And Death of some children or not? I can't remember. Does she lose any children? The death of her children, does she regret marrying? No, she doesn't. But nearly every man in the, in, in the merchant's tale does regret marrying. So you should not always think about similarities but contrasts. Okay, let's talk about glaring errors. This really gets up, a, up, up really annoys the examiners. The examiners should be retired teachers earning that their summer holiday money, if you like, and they always think, oh, standards have gone down because I'm not teaching anymore. Don't make these glaring errors. It's a play to an audience. People often talk about it, a book to the reader. Don't do it. It's a play to an audience, and it's a 17th century Jacobean play. It is a revenge tragedy. Whereas The Merchant's Tale is a verse narrative. So it's a narrative told in verse. It's a story told in verse. It's in Rhyme Royale. Rhyming couplets or iambic pentameter rhyming couplets. It's from the 1380s. I don't know exactly when. We're not quite sure when it was written, but it's around the 1380s and that makes it the 14th century. So get your centuries right. Okay? Because that kind of, it just looks a bit shoddy if you don't. So things you should know about the, the merchant before we move on. It's quite conversational. The speech is peppered with idioms. You know, for well I know, for well I would, for well I know. Uh, the merchant is kind of, it's trying to be conversational, conversational like a story being told. 
It is your poetry text. It is your poetry text. And so I advise you to treat it like your poetry text. So mention a couple of poetic techniques that are used, even though AO2 is not, it's not directly assessed. So that you're aware that it's actually your poetry text. We talked about two, we talked about three. Um, it's in verse, but sometimes it's conversational. Use of rhyme maybe highlights, it, it draws attention to individual words. Uh, and those individual words might be related to the theme. We talked about Fablo, we talked about nine. 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. Actually, number 14, maybe if, if we think about Kitty Canterbury Towers or the exploration of um, the seven deadly sins, perhaps pride is one of those as well that, that the Merchant's Tale explores. The pride of the man who thinks something he's not. Okay? And as we know, pride always comes before us all. He's blind, literally and metaphorically. Okay, things you should know too. Wax is referenced one, and then it becomes referenced later on in the tale, making it more funny. It's for it's foregrounded. Okay, Damien, and Damien is a very superficial stock character. He merely represents the devil in the midst, the devil in the garden. Okay. Um, both tales deal with irony. Italy is foregrounded in both tales, but this tale is perhaps a little bit earlier. We've got the feudal three estates. I think we don't need to be massive history students of this, but you know, history students beware. You don't need big chunks of history about the 14th century. But I suppose as a feudal lord, um, the knight is the king in his own area. And so perhaps that explains why he can do what he can do. Uh, May doesn't have any say really in whether she's married to him or not. Uh, you might consider the symbolism of gardens in literature. Um, and maybe the reference to other texts. I always call them authorities or authorities. Try to use the spelling. Okay, authorities. Uh, it, it was the custom, the rhetorical custom in the Middle Ages to cite references or authorities to support your argument. A little bit like you using critics or essays. That was their way of like putting forward an argument as a rhetor rhetorical technique. So we see Justin the Spirit, we see the Merchant do it, we see January do it as well. So the use of octorites in the text is important. I think you get some of that also in Duchess of Malfi as well. We've talked about how there's a marriage group of tales. You should have an awareness of them. The Miller's tale, the um, Clark's tale, the Wife of Bath's tale, and the Merchant's tale are all really about marriage. And so they are commentary on marriage. Some are good wives and some are not. Let's look at how a question kind of looks. Um, you'll get a quote. It'll be theme based. There might be different parts to the quote. You would be very well advised to break down different parts of the quote. You could agree with all of it, agree with part, part of the quote, agree with partially some of it, disagree with all of it. People will come out of this essay thinking I did really crap in that because it was a bit incoherent, a bit messy. It had no kind of linear approach to it, but that's fine. You're being asked to consider uh, ways, different ways, contradictory way, ways. Your essay should be contradictory, okay? It should offer different ways of seeing that quote, okay? And different ways of seeing that particular theme that you've chosen, okay? Uh, but there may well be two parts to this quote. So think about how I might break that down, agree with that part, but not necessarily that part, or agree with all of it. So that's your advice on breaking down the quote. You want to have about four to six different ways of seeing the question. Okay, make sure your topic sentence highlights exactly where you're going with that area. Okay. Try and be comparative, deal with both texts together. Um, 
but usually say two or three points about the first text before you compare. Okay, now well, I'm not looking. Let's, uh, first, I think the first two acts of the Duchess of Malfi are really dealing with how women are, are viewed. We find out all the characters and we see how they how they view them. Solar has a go at the old lady because she's old. She looks old. Doesn't seem very fair, does it? Uh, Antonia, on the other hand, puts the Duchess on a pedestal. She's either an angel or a whore. And you could argue that's how women are seen in the Merchant's Tale as well, isn't it? Um, women are seen as objects of sexual desire or as objects of repressed desire um, or liars. I, as we see, in, you must be sick of like all of these texts. Third man says it as well. Many a woman I have eyed, but not one has been without a flaw or two. And even in the Tempest, we have it, don't we? So, um, so the first two acts, I would say, look for quotes about women and how they're viewed in different ways as either angel or whore. Okay. The soul is quite the soul. I say the soul, but I think a lot of teachers say bottle. I don't know. I don't know what's the correct one. Well, what do you think? Oh. Not a name. Funny that, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he's a malcontent. Be aware that your the most important context that you can write about is the literary context in many ways. So you want to show the examiner that you know what a fablo is or what you love romance and how the merchant's tale relates to the wider context of the Canterbury Tales and how it's a birth narrative. You want to know how how uh, revenge tragedies are put together. You have to have a malcontent. They're outsiders. They don't fit here. Okay? Um, they're, in a way, they are the Renaissance character personified. They are the Renaissance world. We consider that the Renaissance world is breaking away from the fixed order of the universe where everyone has their place. And the Renaissance world is all about individualism. The malcontent is the personification of the Renaissance world. And that's what the What's quite interesting is the clash between the new and the old. And because they don't follow the rules of the world because they're outside of the world, they make up their own rules. And so they they play on their superior knowledge of human nature. Okay. Now the price of knowing about human nature is, and I think it's really true of Bossola, is that he's not afraid to uh, turn his knowledge of human nature on himself. Okay? He's truthful about himself, which is not the case with uh, January. January is not truthful about himself. January is willfully delusional about himself. So consider the contrast between Bossola and uh, January. Quick word about soliloquies. Okay, um, the Duchess has one. Um, Bossola has one, the Cardinal has, has one, and they're always kind of interesting. They either reveal their intention, or if they're in Act 4s and Act 5s, they are a commentary on the world, and they are a commentary on how they think. Tragedies are the same as comedies, same rule. The loss of identity and then identity restored in Act 5. So when you look at the Tempest, everyone loses their identity in Act 1 and then it's restored in Act 4, Stroke 5. Same for tragedy. Restoration of identity always comes too late. It has to end in tragedy. So that's the main difference about comedies and tragedies. So look at the speeches, the soliloquies at the end. They will always be about... Um, how I was wrong, or how I see the world now in a new way. Okay. Okay. Uh, have a collection of quotes about what Ferdinand says about women. Have a collection of quotes about what the Cardinal says about women. It's likely there'll be a question about women. If you look at the combination, there's 24 combinations of text. And each of those combinations of texts has strong women in them. So the idea of there not being a question about women is kind of rare, you know. So look at what people say about women. But look also about what women say about themselves. Webster shows women as deceiving. Julia is uh, in an affair. 
to the cardinal. The Duchess lies. However, John Webster makes two of his most famous plays. He, he has the female character of Victoria in The White Devil and the Duchess of Malfi is the central character. They are not, they, while they might lie, they are not seen as wholly negative characters. It's different to how the merchant portrays May. We can talk about that. So Webster shows women in a sympathetic light. The Duchess compares, she says, am I what? Am I made of... Anyone finish the quote? Am I made of alabaster? What's alabaster? But plaster. I have a beating heart. Okay. She's asking a simple question. I'm just a woman in front of the man asking him if he loves me. Is that right? Act four, four women's in a funeral. Okay, it's the same kind of rom com. Okay, um, Hariola is loyal to death, really, to her. She, uh, as a servant, unlike Damien, she's absolutely loyal. So you might compare how Damien and Hariola are complete, the, completely the different. Women are trapped at the mercy of men. But the Duchess and Victoria, it's worth looking at um, one of the soliloquies of Victoria. The, um, the Duchess and Victoria, they kind of defy their social conventions of their time. She says, so what, I'm a Duchess. I want to live a life as a woman. And she defies um, the misogynistic belief of her age. So it would be worth looking at her... her um, her quotes in Act 4, in which she defies her age, uh, you know, the, the beliefs of her age and the social structures of her age. Try in your answer to talk about the writer's intentions, the playwright's intentions, if you can. Um, perhaps setting it in Catholic Italy is a way for Webster to really cr criticize the court of London and do it without. Um, any uh, backlash. Um, perhaps he's willing to show us a strong woman defying her age, rather like Arabella Stewart. Perhaps he wants to show us how the patriarchy distorts the views of men and how they view women. Ferdinand is described as having a what and a what nature. Perverse and turbulent nature, thank you. Is his perverse nature a result of a distorted misogynistic society? Is Webster ahead of his time criticizing his own age? You could see it that way. Or is Webster merely reinforcing the misogynistic views of men? Um, one thing you could argue is that Webster is celebrating the strength of women because unlike Shakespeare, he shows them as the central characters in his tragedy. Shakespeare doesn't. Despise the convention, she has her killed at the end. So Shakespeare's characters um, are usually kind of revert to, to conserve in tragedy and comedies, they revert to a kind of conservative position. Shakespeare never has any character uh, marry out of their rank. Even though they might have lost their identity, they tend to marry within their rank. So it's not necessarily very radical that way. Okay, other things that you should know about, right? Try to show that you know about the tragedy conventions. Then you're looking at the literary context, malcontents, soliloquies, any kind of banquet and mask always ends in death. The red marriage, the blood marriage in Game of Thrones. Banquets and masks are times of excess, and so they're always a place of punishment. But the main moral message, and it is a didactic teaching moral message in the tragedy of the Duchess of Malfi, is that revenge is corrosive, it's morally corrosive. And that is a true message of all re revenge tragedies. He who sets off for revenge will be best to dig two holes. Okay? Revenge, setting out revenge is like, uh, um, I don't know what the quote is, something about 
drinking the poison yourself and waiting for the other person to die. So the message of revenge tragedies is always the same. It will end badly for both sides. It's, revenge is corrosive. I might talk just a little bit about a moral universe or a religious universe. Even though the Duchess dies, um, we do get a sense of a, uh, a kind of heavenly universe at work or heavenly justice. So even though she dies, we get the sense that she has a Christian death and that she's going to heaven. We get the sense that the Cardinal dies, but he's going elsewhere. We even get the sense that Bossola dies, and he's going somewhere else as well, and it ain't heaven. So we get a sense of a moral universe in tragedies that makes their deaths a little bit more palatable. I don't know if we get that kind of moral uh, conclusion at the end of the, uh, the merchant's tale. She ends up possibly... Uh, pregnant, he's still blind to what she's doing, and uh, we, we don't know if we have that kind of if it if it's such a neat ending. Um, religion allows men to act immorally, and this is true in both texts. And it's worth maybe thinking about the references to religion. January wants to marry because it's so X and so Y. What is X and Y? It's so easy and clean, yes. Clean as in spiritually clean. The man is a lecher and he wants to carry on being a lech, and so he can carry on having sex with young women, but within the protection of marriage. He's using the religious sacrament of marriage, he's abusing it, because he doesn't really believe in it. He's just using it as a shield so that he can get to heaven. The cardinal, in the same way, uses his position and religion to um, kill people, to start wars, to have affairs, uh, to be corrupt. And his position allows him to uh, to be mis misogynistic about women as well. So in both texts, you might look at how religion itself is corrupted and corrupts others. The fact that John Webster sets it in Italy is it's about Catholic. Uh, Christianity, rather than the nice Protestant Christianity of the core of London. So it's merely a way for him to criticise the actions of others uh, for a British audience. So you should consider the British audience. Remember that the play is set indoors to a more elite audience paying more money. So John Webster is giving the drama, uh, is reflecting the society who are watching it back at him. So the society watching it would be the society of the court, watching the actions of the court. And so it's imperative that he sets it in Italy, but it doesn't look like it's a true criticism of the very people paying the money to see his play. So consider the Italian context if you can. Okay. There's some questions about this then. The Duchess of Malfi. Uh, Questions about women, people always forget Carioli and the old lady. And I think Julia is quite an interesting character as well. Julia, yeah, okay, she has an affair. She's married to whom? Who's she married to? Castruccio. Names are always symbolic, aren't they? He can't get it up. That's why he's called Castruccio. Okay? So an old man who can't have sex, his name is implied or suggesting that. It's a bit like January. But she genuinely loves the cardinal. Whether this is moral or not, she does love the Cardinal, and it's worth bearing that out. Okay? And she was true to the Cardinal, even in deception. So you often get a question about how there's deception in truth, and lies in de uh, deceit in truth, and truth in deceit. Julia is, in a way, loyal. And it's always forgotten. People just dismiss her as you know, uh, an adulteress. But she's loyal to the cardinal, and it's him who spurns her. She says, you made me fall in love with you. I didn't want to, but you made me. And I did, and I was genuinely in love with you. And she kisses the book, Bible. And that's her death is seen as, a, as, as not a fitting death. It seems like really cruel, and it seems really, it, it's about his abuse of religion rather than 
for having a sitting desk. Um, lust in revenge tragedies always goes with madness, and um, it's worth maybe considering uh, Ferdinand's perverse and turbulent lust for his sister. Um, we've got Jews of marriage, they try and persuade her not to marry. And again, it mirrors Justinus and Justinus's argument at the beginning of the play. But in her marrying, they will have their wealth issues as well. So marriage is used for selfish reasons in both places. Okay, I'm nearly done because I realize I've gone over time. In tragedies, it's always worth considering the last lines of plays. In tragedies, it's always worth considering the last lines of characters. Only in death do characters really gain vision and insight. They've been blind for most of the play. Ferdinand is blind to his own lust, and that's why he goes mad, blind to his own insanity. But at the end of the play, unlike January, who is blind, temporarily, or you could say he's blind temporarily, Ferdinand's blind temporarily, and he comes back to vision, and he says, whether we fall by ambition, blood, or lust, by diamonds we're cut with our own dust. We are formed from our own sins. He says, what goes around comes around. Okay? We get what we deserve. Okay? In the end, the love or the hate that we make okay, comes back at us. Now, um, the last lines of the Duchess, Antonia. Yes, madam, he is living, says Bosla. Bosla lies to her. But he lies in a charitable way. So consider how some lies are necessary in life. Okay? The Duchess has to lie. She isn't untruthful, but she has to lie because of her position. Her last line is mercy. She gets a spiritual death. She gets justice in the, in the other world. She uses explicitly Christian language at the end, which is foregrounding that she's going to heaven. The Jacobean audience are very concerned with a good death, right? Anyone dying a death that might hinder their way to heaven is seen as that's seen as a really terrible death. And it's just for really evil characters, but not for good characters. So Webster really links her to a Christian heaven. Her final word is mercy. And that's what she's given. Okay, she's going to heaven. Bossola lies and telling her that, but it's a, it's a merciful lie. Bosola is not all bad. Uh, but he does realize at the end that he's off on another voyage. Okay. Uh, what voyage is he going to? And where's the, what, what, what river is he on? The River Six, the journey over to hell, the classical illusion. Bosola knows where he's going. Okay. Bossola knows what he is because I'm a base intelligentsia. That's what I am. You know, this is how we rise in the world by being little bastards, if you like. And he knows it. He knows what he is. And so you can compare Bossola to what Daniel doesn't know what he's. Okay? I think. Therefore, let's just finish on the on, on the context that you want us to, you want to get into your essay. Sometimes it can just be merely in passing. As this is a tragedy, and tragedies always uh, have a moral message that revenge is wrong, it could just be that. Uh, we see that all characters must die. You know? So uh, always consider some of these things. Um, the influence of Shakespeare is in all of the plays as well. Um, but remember that the audience know what they're going to watch. They, so there's a lot of foreshadowing of what their, their expectations. There's a lot of dramatic irony in tragedies because of the nature of its tragedy. You know, it's going to end. Okay. Um, I think we covered most of those. That's it. Okay. That's it. Thanks for your time today, everyone. Best of luck next week. Unfortunately, I think there's teacher training next week. And so, uh, I don't think there will be a tutorial next Thursday, but I'll let you know if there is.
I've emailed you some resources from today on the drafting. Okay, so that's the drafting. Thank <laughs> you. 